Chunk 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 Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Practical MDO. I'm feeling like this is going to be a great one because I've had just the perfect amount of coffee today. Today we'll be talking about gradient-based multidisciplinary optimization. This is a big deal. This is the whole focus of this course. And in fact, this lecture is really going to be more of an overview of what gradient-based MDO is, why we want to do it, and what you can do with it. Heck, I don't even think we'll have an accompanying notebook for this one. This lesson is the main cornerstone of many others in this lecture series. You can think of this lesson as a very thick branch in the tree of this course, upon which many other branches, fruits, and leaves are attached. So, let's talk about this. The entire goal of the short course is to motivate and teach you how to do gradient-based design optimization. There are many reasons why we need to do this, but the main reason is that gradient-based design optimization is our only hope for highly dimensional, complex, multidisciplinary problems. These problems often crop up in aerospace, wind energy, automotive design, satellite design, and so many other applications that are performance-driven. It's amazing. This deals with all three main topics of this course, optimization, modeling, and differentiation. You might have guessed that based on the title. I'll go through a few main points here. The first is, what is gradient-based MDO? Let's just spell it out. I love spelling things out. So here are the words here. Gradient-based multidisciplinary design optimization. Sometimes I personally get confused if the D in MDO is for disciplinary or design. It's for design, usually. So let's break this down piece by piece. First, we have gradient-based. What does that mean? That means that we have some notion of the derivatives or the gradients of the design space. We know that if we move in one direction in the design space, the performance either gets worse or better. This is more information than a gradient-free method, which only knows the function value of the design space. I like to think about this as if you're trying to climb a mountain, it really helps to know which way is steeper. If you're blindfolded and you're just standing on some path, it may be unclear which direction to go. However, if you're not blindfolded on the path, and you're able to look around and see, okay, well, the mountain is up this way, and this is where the path is, I'm going to go in that direction. That sounds great. You can think of gradients in the same way. They help tell you which direction to go in the design space to get the most out of your system. Next up, we have multidisciplinary. I never took Latin, but if you break this down, it has to do with having multiple disciplines in your model. So here's just one example of that. So here we have this XDSM structure, and it's got an aerostructural wing design case here. We have geometry as one discipline, aerodynamics, structures, and functionals. When I say multidisciplinary, it can be two to n disciplines, where n could be a huge number. In conceptual aircraft design, you might care about 20 plus disciplines. In floating offshore wind turbine design, you might also care about that many. There are many cases where multidisciplinary becomes an extremely huge definition. But just know it has to do with any sort of trade-offs between different disciplines or analyses. Next up, we have design. The whole idea here is that we're able to design a system. We're not analyzing it. I'm going to speak frequently about analysis versus optimization. You can think of design as optimization. So, Design is where we care about maybe the physical system or the operational system and what this means. This is kind of shown graphically here. We have design variables that come into an analysis and outcome performance metrics. These design variables are what a human would control if they're the designer. You can imagine a, a human sits down and says, hey, this airplane should have wings. Okay, I'll draw two wings here. I'll put some engines on it. I have to choose if it has two or four engines. I have to choose the shape of the airfoil. These are all design variables or, or things that can be varied. Design variables, canonically, are anything that the optimizer is controlling as well. So when I say design, I'm talking about, in this case, automated design, computational design. You could iterate through this by hand, and you could say, okay, this performance is better. This is what I want. I'm going to keep these design variables. But let's talk about a better way to do that. And, and really, this kind of tees us up for this optimization discussion. So optimization is a formal way to find the best design. In this case, we're trying to minimize an objective function, and we're doing that with respect to design variables. These design variables are shown as the vector x here. And again, they could be anything that you're, you're varying in the system. They could be your geometry, the operations, uh, how much power you're supplying to the engines, anything and everything that you're looking to design. Now we're trying to minimize this objective function subject to constraints, either inequality or equality constraints. You can imagine you don't want your wing to break, uh, so we have some structural failure constraints. You can imagine for a wind turbine, you might need the tower design to be within a certain boundary so that it can be transported on rail cars. So that's another idea of a constraint. The whole idea of optimization here is that we can formulate some performance metrics, some objective function that we're trying to minimize or maximize. Then we have to define the design variables that are affecting this objective function and any constraints that are present in the design space. Putting all of these words together, 
is gradient-based MDO. It's a very complex problem because of its multidisciplinary nature. We have to consider multiple disciplines, how they interact together, how data and derivatives are being passed between them. This is a very, very challenging problem. Now I want to motivate why we need to do gradient-based design optimization. Here is a figure, it's figure 1.23 from Engineering Design Optimization by Martin Zimning, and it's an extremely stark and powerful figure. If we take a look at the x-axis here, it says number of design variables, and on the y-axis we have the number of function evaluations. This is the number of function evaluations to complete an optimization. We have in blue the gradient-free methods, and in red, gradient-based methods. Now you might say, John, the gradient-based methods are not plotted, it's, it's not seen here. Ah, contraire. It would be rude of you to think that Martins and Ning were not plotting the gradient base methods because they are. It's just so close to the x-axis that it appears very flat. As you increase the number of design variables in your design problem, the gradient-free methods scale terribly. The number of functional evaluations to reach an optimum increases greatly. However, gradient based methods do not scale in such a way. This is because they have knowledge of the gradient, they have knowledge of the derivative, and where to move within the design space. If you greatly increase the number of design variables, it's okay. It does increase a little bit using gradient-based methods, but not nearly as drastically as gradient-free methods. Additionally, if you're getting your gradients in an efficient way, usually analytic or automatic differentiation, then you're able to do this in much, much less computational time than using gradient-free methods. I'll have some links in the description below to other lectures that go into more detail about this. Now, another thing I want to highlight here is the focus on multidisciplinary design optimization, or MDO. This is figure 13.34, again from Engineering Design Optimization. You might say, eh, John, it's okay, I don't need to do MDO. I'm going to simply design the aerodynamics, pass this information to the structures team, they'll pass it on to the propulsion team, and, and we'll be okay. They'll pass it on to the, the operations team, they can make the mission based on that. Well, you're leaving some performance on the table if you do this. If you use a sequential approach, you're not entirely accounting for the actual coupled nature between these disciplines. This figure is showing the design space for two different optimization methods. In gray, we have the sequential method where we first change the aerodynamics, in this case, the wing tip jig twist or the twist of the wing, and then we design the thickness of the wing spar. You can see at any given time for the sequential, we only move vertically or horizontally in the design space. This is because we're only affecting either the aerodynamics or the structures, never both at the same time. However, in an MDO formulation, multi-disciplinary design optimization, we're able to control, in this case, both aerostructural disciplines at the same time. This allows us to move in any arbitrary direction within the design space. As you can see in this case, the sequential optimum is not the same as the MDO optimum. This is because the MDO case is able to accurately capture the trade-offs between these disciplines. You can see that it's pushed right up against the stress constraint, this failure constraint for the structure, and, and so is the sequential result, but if we take a look at the contour lines here, the objective function value is lower. Here the objective value is fuel burn for an aircraft. And so if we're able to get to a lower value of fuel burn while meeting all of the constraints, that's fantastic. We got some more performance out of that. This really motivates the use of MDO instead of the sequential approach. It is worth it to formulate these multidisciplinary problems and solve them, especially for highly and tightly coupled systems. Now heck, let me show you some of these coupled systems. Here is an optimization case that comes out of the MDO lab where they were looking at toe-steered composite laminates. What this means is that you have some control of the shape and the orientation of the fibers within a wing box. This allows you to very directly tailor the structural performance of the wing. Now, of course, you need to have the aerodynamic loads on the wing, so this is inherently an aerostructural problem. The toe-steering parameterization introduces a lot of design variables into this design space. You can see how continuous and fluid the design space is because there are so many different options for the optimizer to choose. This would be extremely intractable with gradient-free methods. We need to use gradient-based methods here to solve this extremely complex and expensive multidisciplinary problem. Additionally, the toe-steered wing box is extremely coupled to the aerodynamic performance of the wing. So this aerostructural problem really benefits from an MDO approach instead of the sequential approach. Next up, I have a fantastic video that comes out of the MDO lab at University of Michigan and NASA Glenn. The whole idea here is if we have an engine at the back of an airplane, it's ingesting different airflow than if the, the engines were under the wing. However, you can imagine that this inherently directly couples the performance of the engine with the aerodynamics of the airplane. This creates an extremely complex problem, an amazingly complex multidisciplinary problem that we must use gradient-based design optimization to solve. So I'm telling you that we should be doing gradient-based multidisciplinary design optimization, but I want to acknowledge that it is challenging. It's a hard thing to do, and it's hard to do for good reason. 
These are complicated systems that have a lot going on. There are a lot of interdisciplinary trade-offs. Often the computational cost of them is high. Additionally, if you're trying to get analytic derivatives, you often have to actually compute these, which means that to get to lower computational costs, you have to invest some developer cost to be able to get these derivatives and pass the information around. But now the great thing is that OpenMDO helps you do this. OpenMDO really helps you do gradient-based MDO. I want to highlight one detailed way that OpenMDO helps you do this. Here is a view of your system model. In this case, we have the geometry or structural design like we were showing before. At the same time that this exists in OpenMDO as a nonlinear system model, there is also a corresponding linear system model. You need both the nonlinear and linear system models if you're doing gradient-based MDO. It's like Thelma and Louise, the J and Bay, the Mario and Luigi of MDO. What I mean by this is that you need to be able to solve the linear system. You need to be able to solve for derivatives to be able to use gradient-based optimization efficiently. Now, the beauty of OpenMDO is that when you set up a system model behind the scenes, it has a nonlinear and a linear system. You simply say, okay, this is the compute function for the nonlinear system, and here is the compute partials for the linear system. OpenMDO behind the scenes sets up these puzzle pieces, puts them together, and passes the information between them. So on the left here, we have the nonlinear system, what is used when you call run model in OpenMDO. And on the right, we have the linear system, which is used when you say compute totals, which is computing the total derivatives for the system. We need both the nonlinear and linear systems for optimization. Now it's beautiful that OpenMDO handles a lot of this behind the scenes. If you were to code this up by hand, it would be extremely developer costly. It would be, I don't know, insane. You'd have to train people so hard on just understanding what all these things mean, how to solve the systems, how to pass the information together. It, it would also be rife with potential for errors. All this is really motivating. If you want to do gradient-based MDO, I highly suggest you do it in OpenMDAO. One tagline that I really like for OpenMDO is that it makes hard things easy and it makes impossible things hard. I find this to be true. And, and let's look at some motivating pictures for this. So here's some examples of highly complex coupled multidisciplinary systems that have been solved using OpenMDO. On the top right, we have aerostructural wing design. On the bottom left, we have a potted engine coupled to the aerodynamics and propulsion systems. We have satellites as they're orbiting across the earth and, and tracking some information about them. But it's not just that. Going in a little bit deeper, we can look at these high fidelity analyses like I was talking about. If we have CFD and FEA and you want to very carefully model something using high fidelity, you can do that with an OpenMDO. You can do that with an optimization loop. But here's one issue with that. Higher order tools or higher fidelity tools are very sensitive to geometry. It really matters when you perform optimization. Thus, this kind of motivates the use of analytic derivatives. We need to be able to use analytic derivatives with these higher order methods to allow it to be computationally tractable. And again, I, I can't stress enough, this is what OpenMDO is helping you do. It's helping you use these analytic derivatives to do gradient-based optimization for these applications. If there's one set of figures I really want to drive home in this section, it's these. So here on the x-axis, we have the fidelity. The accuracy and the computational cost of the model are kind of wrapped up in the fidelity. And then on the y-axis, we have the number of disciplines, so how multidisciplinary something is. If it's at the bottom here, it may only be one discipline. If it's at the top, it may be 20 or more disciplines. It could be the entire system that we're concerned about. There used to be a sort of kind of a dashed line here that separates out where you can do optimization with analytic derivatives. You could only handle so many disciplines. You could only handle a certain level of fidelity. Beyond that, you'd have to use surrogate models, design of experiments, or gradient-free optimization methods just due to the number of disciplines. Some of these highly multidisciplinary systems include conceptual aircraft design, so something very early in the design process when you're considering many aspects of the plane at the same time, not doing detailed design. Another option is wind farm system design. So you're not just looking at one wind turbine blade, you're looking at the you're looking at the blades within a wind turbine with an entire wind farm system. You can imagine this to be a highly complex system with many different disciplines acting. So the goal of OpenMDO is to remove any sort of barrier here. The idea is to be able to use optimization, gradient-based optimization with analytic derivatives across this entire spectrum. You can see here some of the things highlighted with the black border are things that have been done in OpenMDO. We have that CubeSat design that I showed before, aeropropulsive design for boundary layer ingestion, you know, that special engine in the back, aerospace battery design, aircraft design with thermal constraints. So this is really, really interesting stuff here that wasn't possible before. We are now able to use gradient-based multidisciplinary design and optimization techniques with this many disciplines. Model developers are able to create these models, piece them together in OpenMDO, and then actually perform the analysis and optimization using OpenMDO. My next series of figures are just a few example application cases. And what I really like here are these kind of radar plots. These radar plots show from the center the level of fidelity within a given discipline. So here this would be low fidelity, this next string would be medium fidelity, and this last string would be high fidelity. And then on the outside edge, we have different disciplines. 
So for this boundary layer ingestion problem that I've shown before, this fancy looking aircraft with the special engine in the back, we're looking at high fidelity aerodynamics at the same time that we're looking low and medium fidelity propulsion. We also have medium fidelity geometry going on here as we perturb the size and shape of this potted engine. So by looking at this, we can see, okay, we can use a mix of fidelity levels in OpenMDO and it's A-OK. -okay. We can have this pretty high fidelity CFD mesh at the same time as we're using this low to medium fidelity propulsion code, couple them together and perform a design optimization all at the same time. Another sample case is this trajectory thermal coupling. We're able to capture this in a mission-based optimization, which is very important for electric aircraft design. Here we're looking at more disciplines. We have one, two, three, four at the low level and two at the medium level. We have propulsion, trajectory, sizing, thermal, fuselage aerodynamics, and rotor aerodynamics. These are all extremely important disciplines to consider when doing electric aircraft design. By implementing these models in open we're able to do this gradient-based optimization. Here's a very neat idea that you can use a singular framework and then hot swap analyses based on what you're trying to solve. So we could be looking at a very detailed aerostructural design optimization for wings. Here we may want to use high fidelity or low fidelity aerodynamics, and we may want to use high or low fidelity structures. Then there are many different tools that could be useful here. We could use high fidelity CFD like AD flow, or we could use the lower fidelity vortex lattice method like VLM, like Open Aerostruct. OpenMDO allows you to choose which building blocks are being used, group them together, and then pass data and information between them. Additionally, because most of this data passing happens behind the scenes, you don't have to worry about what it means to have these little plus signs here. When you couple these tools together, you simply say, hey, this block, talk to this block, group them together, and see what happens. If you were to not use OpenMDO and you tried to code these all together, you'd have to handle all the data and derivative passing to do gradient-based optimization. By offloading this work to the framework, in this case OpenMDO, it saves you a lot of both developer time and computational time. And I just want to close by saying that OpenMDO allows you to use gradient-based optimization. And again, like I tried to motivate in the beginning of this lecture, gradient-based MDO is our only hope for solving computationally expensive, high-dimensional problems. All right, so this was a more biased than usual lecture, but I really want to drive home the point that gradient-based MDO is hard, it's challenging, but it's so powerful. It's our only hope for solving these very complex, multidisciplinary problems. Additionally, if you want to do gradient-based MDO, you should probably use OpenMDO. It might be simpler to use Model Center or Simulink or, or something else that exists, but None of those tools are purpose-built to help you solve gradient-based multidisciplinary problems. Like others have said, OpenMDO makes the hard easy and makes the impossible hard. So let's go solve some tough multidisciplinary problems. As always, mash those like and subscribe buttons if you like what you've seen today. Guys, gals, and non-binary pals, till next time, thank you for watching.